Indian society is one of the oldest in the history of the world. Uh, the history of India from, let us say, from the Indus Valley Civilization to 1757, that is the Battle of Plassey, which covers roughly a period of about 5,000 years. Now, this long period it is a history of independent India. After that, it was dependent India. And this country, this vast country, is a home of many nationalities uh, of different sizes. And each of these nationalities has its own language. The first thing is the language. The language, the culture, uh, way of life, its own economy, etc. And in India's long history, uh, there were only a few strong central governments. I Means before the coming of the British, the first is the Mojo, then we have the Gupta, and then after that the Mughals. But the important point is that none of them embraced all parts of India. Now, as regards uh, economic conditions, agrarian system, the industrial organization, uh, trade, etc., uh, there was great diversity. And as a, in a strict sense of the term, there was no one Indian society as such but a number of societies at different stages of development. That was the situation. We will deal with the agrarian social structure in uh, pre-British India, that is Mughal India, mainly Mughal India. So that brings us to the second part, that is uh, land and village society. Now, under the Mughals, the state expropriated the produce mainly from land of two types. One was the Khalisa land. Khalisa land was a crown land, uh, which was somewhat similar to the Shita land during the Mojo period in, in the ancient uh, stage of our of Indian history. The Mughal state extracted revenue through its own agents. There are officials, revenue officials, who collected the revenue from uh, the Khalisa lands. But this Khalisa land comprised only a small fraction of the total land under the Mughal states. The major portion of the land uh, were, was parceled out as Jagis, Jagir lands. These were, these were parceled out among the Jagirdars. And some of them became Mansabdars also. Mansabdars who were those owners of Jagis who had military ranks. That is, a Mansabdar is always a Jagiddar, but not all Jagiddars were Mansabdars. And the duty of the Jagiddars or the Mansabdars was to maintain units of the army. And they got part of that revenue in lieu of pay for maintaining the vast army. And the Jagirs were usually transferred from one to another, one Jagiddar to another. And it, there was an interval of about three years. Uh, so since it was transferable, it was not hereditary. And apart from the Jagirdars, there are also autonomous chiefs. There are also many Rajas, Maharajas and others uh, who uh, had to pay the expected tribute to the emperor, to the king. They, after that, they were free to exercise their autonomy over their own territories. They usually continued to enjoy Jamindari rights and many other privileges. And there was one condition, very important condition, that is each of them was had to render military service to the state in times of need. That is a, an important precondition. Now, besides this, there were some uh, intermediate classes of local jaminders, small jaminders, revenue grantees, generally religious persons who got land, uh, urban and rural traders were there, shops were there, uh, usurers, uh, money lenders, they were there. The villages were generally of two types. Uh, one was the Rayoti village or villages which were held by the peasants themselves. And the other was the Jamindari village. Now, in the Jamindari villages, the Jamindars were held responsible for the collection of land revenue and then send it to the royal exchequer. But uh, they were not proprietors of the soil. And they also 
did not have the right to uh, enhance the land revenue. Land revenue is something which was a central affair. So nobody else, nobody apart from the central government was in a position to either to decrease or to increase, to do anything with the amount of the land revenue. But at the same time, it was true that they could also impose uh, cesses, their own rates, and squeeze the peasants. And side by side, uh, they had a claim to a share of the land revenue. And in this way, they could uh, exploit, they could subject the peasantry to various forms of exploitation. According to Baden Powell, who wrote uh, land systems in British India, he also said that there was the existence of another type of village which had the appearance of joint or common ownership. That there was a third type of land. That has been pointed out by Baden Powell. Now, the Jemindas, apart from this, had also their own land holdings. And in their own land holdings, they, uh, on, on those land holdings, they gradually came to acquire proprietary rights. Uh, they could hire agricultural workers to till their own land or rent them out to the tenants. Now, we have referred to the uh, top stratum of the Jaminders. Top stratum of the Jaminders, they comprise part of the ruling class. But the small Jaminders, uh, small who are local in character, they had many ties with the peasantry. In many cases, a small Jaminder belonged uh, to a caste or subcaste, which is also the caste or the subcaste of the peasants. And these Jaminders, they were not absent landlords, unlike the British period. They were not absent landlords. They, they stayed in the villages. And they had developed ties with the village people for various reasons. When the struggle for land, land revenue or rent became intensified among the feudal elements, uh, contradictions arose between the Jagidars and the local Jaminders. And peasant rebellions were sometimes led by the local Jaminders. So despite the fact they, that they themselves belonged to the feudal class, they formed also feudal class, but since they were petty feudal lords, so their contradictions with big feudal lords was very, were very sharp. And they often sided with the peasants who also suffered from their oppression, though in lesser degrees, no doubt. Now, land revenue, except in some areas, was collected in cash. So, cash collection was the general rule. And even in the 14th century, that is before the coming of the Mughals, uh, payment in cash had been in practice over wide areas. Irfan Habib points out that uh, cash collections were the rule at the beginning of Akbar's time. And the amount of the land revenue was highest during the Mughal period. The Soviet historian Pavlov, he pointed out that as a result of the influx of gold and silver due to the price revolution in Europe, gold and silver were available in huge quantities in, in our country. And so there was money circulation. Now Karl Marx pointed out while he dealt with uh, the development of capitalism, etc. He pointed out that the uh, transformation of rent in kind into money payment, that is rent in cash, presupposed something. It presupposed the development of sufficient commerce, development of urban industry, of commodity production in general, and hence money circulation. And in pre-colonial India too, the revenue demand in cash naturally led to the production of cash crops, commercial crops, and presupposed also a considerable development of commerce, urban industry, commodity production, etc. Now, it is true that in the pre-British period, villages were self-sufficient. There is no doubt about it. But that does not mean that the villages were closed units. Villages were definitely uh, in touch 
with the world outside. As a matter of fact, it was also vulnerable to the caprices of the market outside and the villages were also uh, touched, influenced by merchant capital, usury capital that had already developed during that period. As for example, there were both bazaars, that is the retail market or the mandis, that is the wholesale market. And there was also uh, sufficient uh, development of inland and coastal trade between far-flung cities. In pre-colonial India, the possession and use of the land was not common. It was individual. And the individual peasant had the hereditary right of occupancy to his own plot of land so long as he paid the land revenue. As long as he paid the land revenue, he was the occupier. He had the occupancy right, not the proprietor's right, but the occupancy right over his own plot of land. Now, an important question that has been raised was whether there was private ownership of land. Generally speaking, private ownership in land in the bourgeois sense, that is in the sense uh, in a sense in which a commodity could be freely bought and sold in the market. Land, like any other commodity, can be bought and sold in the market. Now, that did not exist. When you talk about the legal ownership, that did not exist. In fact, there were diverse interests in land and no exclusive form of ownership. Many people had diverse interests in land. So you cannot uh, you cannot say that this plot of land or this area belongs to me or to, to some particular person because other people also enjoyed some privileges, enjoyed some, some rights uh, over those areas. But it is also true that uh, private property in land was not wholly absent. It was present both in the pre-Mughal period and of course in the Mughal period. We have Abul Fazal's Aini Akbari, and Abul Fazal describes the state's revenue demand as a tax on the property of the subject. Revenue demand as a tax on the property. Property means private property, individual property. So the sense is clear that private property definitely existed in the Mughal period. And of course, also in the earlier period, pre-Mughal period, in South India or in some other places also. And another historian, Shotish Chandra, uh, points out that uh, there are also a number of references to the sale and purchase of land in documents, most of which relate to the second half of the 17th century. So we have sufficient evidence to prove that land could be sold, could be bought also, at least in some areas, as India was a country of uneven development. so all parts should not enjoy the same form of development. So we cannot have the same picture in all the regions. Now that brings us to the village community. The village community existed in most of the Indian villages, though not in every village. Village community was generally an administrative unit. It was responsible for the collective payment of land revenue to the state's officials or the revenue farmer, and they managed to uh, manage the common pool from which the village officer, priests, menials, artisans, they were given remuneration in kind for the services rendered by them. Now, village communities were not, no, were no egalitarian classless societies. That was an idyllic concept. No, that is not true. But the village communities that was very much marked by sharp contradictions, sharp class contradictions. And a considerable portion of the revenue was extracted by the jaminders, by the landlords, forcefully. These were appropriated by the jaminders. So contradictions were very sharp between the jaminders, between the landlords and the peasants. Then the peasantry itself was not a homogeneous class. As for example, there were some peasants who had the hereditary right of occupancy to the land. Occupancy rights, one section. Then we have the tenants, the second section. And then we have the landless agricultural workers. 
Now, the peasants who enjoyed the hereditary right of occupancy to the land they cultivated and could not be dispossessed if they paid the assessed land revenue on time, they were again divided into two categories. One was the khud caste peasant and the other was the pahi caste peasant. Now, khud caste peasant peasants or mirastar peasants were those peasants whose who who had their home and land holdings in the same village and pahi caste peasant is that that peasant whose land was in a village or jamindari outside his own this was the difference and it has been pointed out by various scholars that uh, towards the end of the Mughal period, there was a tendency on the part of some Jaminders, revenue grantees, or Mirasi peasants to convert their right of occupancy to their holdings into an ownership right. And that is more or less clear. And uh, there was the employment of wage labor, which was not uncommon, though payment was made mostly in kind. And so both these features of capitalist production, uh, employment of hired labor and production for the market, however limited the extent might have been, uh, both of them made their emergence in some parts of India before the advent of colonial rule. Sir, in this dominantly agricultural economy, was there any mercantile element? Uh, yes, uh, there was a definite mercantile community in Mughal India, which was very powerful which uh, exercised much influence over the economy and was very much tied up with the state. Uh, there was also capitalist production. The main industry, uh, main form of industry in the Mughal period, of course, was handicraft industry. But apart from handicrafts, there, there was also manufacturing, which was the second stage of capitalist production, where we have division of labor, uh, where we have production for the market, etc. So manuf that stage had been reached, and capitalist production, of course, made, it emer made its emergence in some sectors, shipyards, diamond mining, uh, iron and steel, etc. And where there was employment of wage labor, production for the market. So mercantile elements, uh, capitalist elements, uh, these were there. And of course, there was the potential for capitalist development in country. And there is a paper on it by Irfan Habib where he dealt with the potentialities of capitalist development. So that element was very much there uh, in, the, in the period we are dealing with. Sir, uh, you are saying that in pre-colonial India, land was generally not regarded as a com commodity in the bourgeois sense. You are also saying that the land could be very easily bought and sold. Are the stated facts not therefore contradictory? Uh, no, not contradictory. Now, actually, uh, uh, we were talking about the legal ownership. It was the British who introduced, when they introduced land settlements, permanent settlements, etc., legal ownership of land. Now, uh, we have pointed out that uh, in land during the Mughal period, there were various forms of rights over land, occupancy rights. Proprietary rights, yes. The Mughal state, theoretically, all the states are the legal owners of land. State is the owner, no doubt about it. But state cannot be called a private individual. Uh, and uh, state's main purpose was to extract the surplus from land. Now, and there are many people, there are many agencies through which it collects its money. Now, they were not the private owners. Uh, and in fact, there were, Jamindars were not private owners. Once Jagiddars were not private owners. So, uh, private ownership of land, meaning that land is a commodity, like any other commodity. Now, that was not there. That is the general observation. But then side by side, in some areas, as has been pointed out by Abul Fazol or other historians, they say that there was buying and selling of land also. So since India is a vast country, uh, it was a law of uneven development that was in operation. But generally, from the do dominant point of view possibly, uh, private ownership of land in the sense the bourgeoisie uses it, that was possibly absent 
in, uh, in our country. There is some dispute among scholars about uh, the mode of production in India during the Mughal period. Uh, many of you must have been familiar with Karl Marx's uh, Asiatic mode of production theory. He was speaking of a society when uh, there was common ownership of land, blending of agriculture and uh, agriculture and handicrafts, etc. Uh, absence of private ownership. But uh, it was something of a static society, more or less a pre-class society. That was his earlier observation. But later on, of course, Marx uh, revised his opinion to say that it was not that static. Shomir Amin has another view. He, uh, in his work entitled Unequal Exchange, says that it was the tribute paying mode in which the state class does not own the land and land belongs to the community. That is his observation. Uh, however, as we have pointed out already, uh, land generally belong to individuals and hardly to the community. Now, there are other scholars also like uh, Daniel Thorner, Alice Thorner, who argue that feudalism without manners serves feudal contract or vassals is not feudalism at all. And so the term is not applicable to India. Uh, if we compare the Indian situation with the situation in other countries, uh, it can be seen that uh, India had already entered the late feudal stage uh, during the late Mughal period, that is on the eve of the uh, advent of colonial rule. And feudalism, Indian feudalism had been on the way and it was uh, stood face to face with a crisis and it afflicted all parts of feudal life. Now, as a matter of fact, in the Mughal period, the struggle for income from land intensified to a large extent. There was a vast army to maintain. Then there were conflicts among the aristocrats themselves, Jagiddars. There was a Jagiddari crisis uh, in fighting among different feudal forces. Then there were peasant rebellions from time to time. Then there was foreign invasion. And there was a large standing army which, was, which had to be maintained. Uh, that was one thing. Then in the ideological sphere, there was also, there were important developments. Uh, there were movements for democratizing the existing social relationships. We have the most Im important example in the Bhukti movement, which was a movement of the oppressed people of the feudal society against both Hindu and Muslim orthodoxy, obscurantism, etc. And they, it, uh, this movement upheld the doctrine of social equality and sought to democratize the existing social relationships. And side by side, there was uh, the trend towards the growth of private property in land, employment of hired labor in agriculture, growing stratification of the peasantry, monetization of the economy, and the expansion of the simple commodity production, etc. Sir, my question is, what were the differences in feudalisms of Europe and in India? Uh, one obvious difference was the existence of manners, no doubt, no doubt about it. Manorial system. We cannot have manners what we have in Western Europe. Of course, we have uh, labor service, we have rent in kind, rent in cash, these are there. Uh, vasas were there. The Jagiddas, Mansabdars, they were Vasas, no doubt. So, uh, existence or non-existence of manners, existence of manners in Europe and non-existence of it in, in our country. That is one important difference. Sir, the topic deals only with the peasants. Does it mean that the craftsmen or artisans had no such significance in that period? No, of course. Uh, uh, yes, even in rural, even in the countryside, uh, there were artisans. And uh, there were, firstly, there were part-time artisans, part-time peasants. That was one fact, one feature. And in the towns, not in the countryside, we have the art guilds, industrial guilds, artisan skills. The putting out system, putting out system, you know about putting out system, putting out system made its, it made its appearance in our country also. 
uh, we have a uh, we have the master craftsman uh, acting also as a worker, also as a supervisor or foreman, employer, shopkeeper, merchant, etc. Uh, Hoverman wrote a very important book long time back, Man's Worldly Goods, where he dealt with you know, he was dealing with medieval Europe, no doubt Europe. He talked about these things. So guild system was there, guilds were there. So artisans did play an important role during that period. There are some scholars who argue that India was on the threshold of an industrial revolution on the eve of colonization. That is one view. Now there is another view. Uh, according to that view, uh, the point here is not the question whether India was on the threshold of an industrial revolution. The more important point is whether India had already reached a stage where a social revolution could take place that would lead to an industrial revolution. First of all, there should be a social revolution. And when you talk about social revolution during the late Mughal period, we are talking about a capitalist revolution. That is the end of the feudal order and the coming of a capitalist society. We know from the writings of Habib and others that uh, there were potentialities for capitalist development in India during that period. But it was at that point of time that foreign rule intervened, colonial rule intervened. And that is the reason why there could be no social revolution. And unless there is any social revolution, you cannot talk about any industrial revolution. Christopher Hill says that England became a capitalist country primarily because in the mid 17th century, there was a social revolution which broke down the fetters, feudal fetters, and paved the path for the full-blooded development of capitalism. So that was the key factor, the social aspect of it. But since colonial rule intervened at that point of time, there could be no social revolution. And when there is no social revolution, one cannot talk about an industrial revolution because industrial revolution must follow and not precede the social revolution. Social revolution must precede uh, the Industrial Revolution. <laughs>